Good morning, everyone, or afternoon. What are we at? It's afternoon. Thank you. It's not even morning where I came from, I guess. Um, we're here to talk today about uh, novel collaborations, pioneering new models for library vendor partnerships with the Folio Project. Um, really, uh, I want to give a brief overview of what uh, Folio itself. How do I advance? There's a bounce. There, one of our partnerships is learning how technology works. <laughs> um, I want to uh, get a little bit into what is Folio, and then um, uh, and then other speakers here are going to talk about sort of who is Folio and how Folio is unique uh, in the library technology landscape these days. Um, and there are a couple other Folio-related presentations at the conference. Um, I don't have the dates and times right in front of me, but I don't know if anybody's got those, but check them out. Um, there'll be one tomorrow on e-resource management functionality in Folio, um, which is gonna be some more nuts and bolts, uh, considerably more nuts and bolts than what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, but so what is Folio? Folio is a collaboration of libraries, developers, and vendors building an open source library services platform. I'll get briefly into platform shortly. Uh, it moves beyond the traditional library management system into a new paradigm where apps are built on an open platform, providing libraries more choice and delivering new services to users. Um, and as we get into, we'll talk a little bit about what that means, because um, that's really just a paragraph there. Um, but this slide, I think, starts to highlight where we, uh, where that concept of a platform gives us the advantages we're looking for. A platform is a, essentially a layer of software that other things can be built on. Um, the, uh, like your iPhone is essentially a platform, People can, or the iOS is a platform that any developer can build apps to put onto, that, that you could load onto your iPhone and interact with either parts of your iPhone already or their systems wherever those may live. Um, Folio is the same concept. Um, it involves open innovation uh, and an open business model where actually any library, any person, any vendor could get involved, um, build an app, uh, update an app, build a workflow, build some piece to uh, either interact with the library world in some way or uh, there are some things that people could think of that probably aren't library related that the Folio platform is the best uh, solution to put that on. Um, it's built around a microservices architecture, um, which lets us think of things of integrating new functionality at, without really having to build the whole infrastructure of the system. Um, so you can build on that platform maybe a full new cataloging module if you decide you've got special ways you want to catalog things. Or a little workflow that lets you buy this particular quirky e-resource that uh, um, that needs to sort of mark a bunch of different things up in your system that a regular e-journal or an e-book might not require. Um, so uh, they can be sort of in any size uh, piece of the system. Um, and it's a vibrant ecosystem of partners uh, that we've built up um, that, uh, that creates economies of scale where the work uh, Cornell University developers are doing uh, feeds the whole project, uh, builds part of Folio, the work that EBSCO's developers and Index Data's developers are doing, and every other uh, member library that's feeding into that uh, really is building the system for all of us. And uh, Folio's feature advantages, um, Folio is being built uh, from the beginning to handle multiple metadata formats. Um, so it's not just being built around Mark or just being built around Dublin Core or anything like that, but being able to integrate uh, records and information from, uh, from different uh, metadata formats um, and really laying the groundwork to be able to use, say, linked data concepts within your library management system without having to retrofit that. Um, multiple knowledge bases, uh, possibly of quite importance to many of the people here. Um, being able to integrate services from different vendors that may require interacting with their knowledge base. Um, already, uh, Folio has demonstrated some interoperability with the EBSCO knowledge base uh, through an e-holdings management tool, um, as well as GoKB, 
Um, and that really lays the groundwork for other vendors that have a knowledge base to build integration tools to, uh, to let users use Folio to interact with their knowledge base, whether it's to activate content or services um, in their systems, uh, or to bring in data from those uh, knowledge bases into Folio. Um, and then a full collection view. Uh, because of those, uh, the varying metadata formats, multiple knowledge bases, and other things we're building into Folio, um, you can really see your whole collection from within Folio and, and access those wherever the sort of raw data about those happens to live. <laughs> okay. Um, and how is Folio unique? Um, how is this different? How is this library vendor partnership different from, uh, from most or, or really every other one that we've worked with? Uh, from its inception, it's been a driven by this partnership. Um, so building Folio has been uh, conceptually, right from the beginning, a partnership of vendors and librarians working together to build a system that works uh, for both of us. Um, rather than a piece of software presented to us by a vendor, uh, we give some feedback, maybe they can fix certain parts of it, maybe they can do some things with it, but. Uh, instead of that back and forth, it's we're, we're doing this together. Um, and it's a council of equals. Uh, the different partners that have come together to build Folio um, really have the same seat at the table to, uh, to influence the direction of, of Folio. And the size and distributed nature um, and, that, and shared responsibility um, are some pros and cons of the process. We've got people all over the world working on Folio. Um, uh, lots of phone calls, lots of Zoom meetings, um, lots of work and work sharing methods to really just get everybody on the same table to drive this uh, drive this home when we can. Um, and then uh, in governance, as I said before, that the Council of Equals concept um, for at every level of governance, there are representatives from some of the various vendors involved, um, many of the different institutions involved, and. Um, Again, we get sort of an equal voice in that in the process of guiding the product. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Kevin Kidd. I am the director of the library at Wentworth Institute, Institute of Technology in Boston. It's a small uh, engineering design uh, university in the Fenway area. And um, I'm also currently the president of the Fenway Library Organization, which is a consortium of 31 Massachusetts academic libraries. And we are involved in the um, uh, Folio project as um, both future adopters um, consortially, so some of the uh, uh, colleges in the consortium will be adopting in, in 2020. But I, I just wanted to give you an um, our sort of point of view as, as, as both a consortium, I'm also as a member of, um, uh, as the president of Flow, on the board of directors of the open library environment of Olay. So I have a bunch of different views into this project, and I just want to explain a little bit about what we see as, as unique about it and, um, and why we are um, diving right into it. Um, I was, in, in a previous position, I was, um, um, the head of systems at the Boston College Libraries, and we, were, we worked with Ex Libris then on the initial development of Alma. And it was a great project. Uh, we had a sort of one-on-one -on -one partnership with Ex Libris on that, and, and um, it was a really fascinating project. But, and it was very much a traditional kind of uh, development, waterfall-type development process. And that contrasts really um, in a really interesting way to what we're doing in the Folio project. So this, this slide that you're looking at is just sort of an, um, trying, to, trying to show how the, um, the roles that uh, the vendor and, um, and say the library or libraries that the vendor is working with um, in a sort of traditional, I'll call it, um, development process work out. So, so you have sort of the requirements gathering communication that's shared between the vendor and the libraries going back and forth. There's a planning process where they're prioritizing what features they want to develop. Um, um, the vendor is working with the libraries to, to sort of do that prioritization. The vendor, of course, also has their own priorities and ideas of where they're taking the product. So um, 
Um, the next step is sort of modeling, that's doing business analysis of the problems they want to solve. Um, again, back and forth between, um, between the vendor but, uh, and the library, but, but really this is the vendor's people doing it, the vendor's developers doing it, and, and the library doesn't have a ton of role in that part. Um, then there's the coding and testing, which is, the coding is almost entirely the vendor's. Um, we have not a lot of insight in that process into what's going on under the hood. Um, testing, of course, is both the vendor and the libraries going back and forth. And then finally, there's deployment, de delivering the system, and, and there you go, here's the system, and now the vendor is supporting it. So there's very kind of distinct, um, defined roles in this kind of traditional model. And I would say to you that the, the Folio project is really different, and I apologize for the, the, if this is sort of confusing, but what it's, what it's um, trying to um, help you visualize is how different the roles are um, in the Folio project. Because it's this distributed um, process, every, every member of the community who's involved in this project actually has access to all the different roles that are involved in the development project. And I found that very striking and, um, and really helpful for us to get buy-in in terms of our consortium because we, we're, not only, we're not only involved in sort of what is going on. We're involved in the governance of the process and helping prioritize and choose um, the features of the system. So in, in the Folio project, you have generally in the, the blue there, you have um, EBSCO, vendor is involved heavily in it, and, and there's certain roles um, that everyone has. The, there's a, the community outside of what the initial stakeholders who started this. So the initial stakeholders, to go back a little bit, were um, EBSCO, Olay, Open Library Environment, which is um, uh, uh, a um, organization of big research libraries and then some smaller consortia, including uh, Flow. And then Index Data is another software uh, development um, company. And um, um, we have representatives here from EBSCO and um, Index Data as well. So hopefully we can chat about, about the roles. And then the roles include go you know, governance, developing, product owners. It's an agile development model. Um, yeah, um, there's special interest groups. And so again, just to show, everybody sort of has access to and the ability to participate in all the different roles. Um, um, subject matter experts are the ones who know really in detail how, to, how a particular set of functions work. Special interest groups are groups that, that kind of get around to discuss um, how to approach problems that you might be interested in, whether it's sort of cataloging or or, um, or metadata management or circulation and things like that. Product owners are the ones who sort of take all that information from those knowledge experts and translate it and, and um, turn it into um, stories that get um, told to um, developers who then actually code. So there are developers from all these groups well, as well, individual libraries, developers from EBSCO, developers from Index Data, developers from Olay. So again, everybody has access to and a participation in this whole process. And finally, there's sort of the governance. There's a product council, which helps prioritize things. It has memberships from all these groups and stakeholders. Um, and there's a technology council um, also that's involved in sort of the, I, I believe it's like the platform right, architecture, things like that. So in any case, um, we see this as a great way for us, who are a bunch of small libraries, um, you know, there's 30 of us, but very small libraries would never have access to this kind of um, um, influence and participation in a project. And this, this for us was really, um, really kind of the thing that we really liked about this project because, because of our influence and access to this. And then the next step is, is and I, we'll talk more about this, but, but some of these partners that we worked with as members of the community then will be the ones who helped us um, implement this application. So Index Data, they're, they're sort of um, one of the principal architects and visionaries of this project. Um, they are going to be, uh, help us implement and be, uh, we built, we, we just had, we're just announced today, I think, a partnership with Index Data. So Fenway Library Organization is gonna work with them to implement um, Folio, and then they are going to be service providers and support providers down the road. So, so we sort of have access to this whole package beginning to the end, and that's why it's been extremely appealing to us. I'm going to pass this off to Tanya, who will explain her role. Mm -hmm. I think I also have to explain my slides. Um, so um, <clears throat> I'm a product owner 
on the Folio project. I worked for a few years at Fenway Libraries, uh, and they're one of the, as you've heard from Kevin, they're one of the um, libraries who have you're contributing a lot um, to the to the project. I'm currently at MIT, so my role is a little smaller than it used to be on the Folio project, but I'm still involved um, as a product owner, and I'll, I'm here to kind of give you the view from the ground of how all of these pieces actually work together in practice and what actually happens. So I don't remember if, um, I don't know if the rest of you remember the, uh, they were very popular in the 80s. You would have these posters of, you know, the view of the world from wherever it is that you um, live, and it would basically, you know, it was a very, you know, local centric view of like, you know, oh, there's like monsters over there, and I think that might have started on the New Yorker, but there's a cool Boston one that I really liked, but I couldn't find a good um, version of that, so I have instead found this other cool one, which shows um, how Boston thinks of themselves in the world, and that's, you know, we think of ourselves as the hub of the universe, and it's a very, um, you know, it's a very sort of like inward looking view of <laughs> your place in the world. Um, and so that's all to say, go to the next slide, that as a product owner, I tend to think of myself as the very center of this project, and everything revolves around me. And I think you could probably say the same for all the other roles that people fill in this project. We all kind of feel like we're the middle of what's happening. Um, and people, I, I find the different groups don't really feel like they're on the periphery of it. We all feel like we're really, really in the middle and engaged. So I just wanted to give you an idea of how the, the players in the project actually feel about their role in it. We actually all do feel like we're very important to the process and have um, a lot of input that is listened to and acted upon. So I'll talk to you a little bit about, no, I don't have any more slides. <laughs> I'll talk to you a little bit about what a product owner does. Um, Kevin touched on it briefly. I meet with the subject matter experts in whatever uh, subject or functional area we're talking about at the moment. And we talk to the, the subject matter experts about, not only about what their current system does and how it might do it differently, but we talk to them about, um, we try to tease out the goals of each of the things that they do so that we can talk um, constructively about, so if this is the goal of what you're trying to do, how does your current system do it well? How does it not do it? Um, how does it, you know, if it does it at all, does it do it poorly for you? And it's really important to know the end goal of what it is you're trying to do so that you can design something that might be better or in some cases as good as what you already have because different ILSs actually do have things that they do really well. Um, so I'll work with the subject matter experts and we'll figure out the different functions that they want, we want to have um, in the system. We'll you know, figure out what the different pieces are. Um, I'll write a feature request for the, for the developers. I'll break it down into little digestible pieces called user stories. Then I'll work with a designer, so we'll mock up some screens to try to um, visually represent what is supposed to happen in the system. And this whole process is a little continuous feedback loop. So I'll talk to the subject matter experts, I'll go away, I'll write some things up, I'll come back and I'll say, this is what I think you were asking me to work up for you, is it right? And we'll probably do a few iterations. We'll do a few iterations with the designers. And then when we feel, we and the subject matter experts feel that it's ready, we will hand it off to the, to the developers. And I'll go to one of the sprint roundup meetings and I will uh, talk the developers through this feature request that we're putting in. Um, and they can ask all kinds of questions. Um, you get clarification of what it is we're trying to accomplish with this and, and some often some background on um, what the purpose of it is and, and how this kind of feature would play out in the, you know, in the real world in the library so that they can really understand how you're, what you're trying to accomplish so that they know that they can try to de design it the best way that they can in the background. And um, sometimes we even, at this point, it goes back to the subject matter experts. I take it back to them because it's not quite clear what it is we're trying to accomplish. Or the developers will actually come up with um, some really pointed questions that indicate to me we still have some things that we need to talk through with the subject matter experts. So again, we've got this continuous feedback loop going on. Once the developers actually, we have it 
you know, in development and they're doing coding for it, um, they'll often come to me with questions during the whole process. So there's a lot of conversations going on constantly with the developers and with the subject matter experts. And I'm translating between these two groups um, because I, I sort of sit in the middle and I've done a little bit of each area um, and I've kind of actually made my career over, uh, of, out of translating between um, well, basically developers and um, frontline folks who actually know how the library works. Um, and then once they've developed something and, and deployed it into test, testers will take a look at it. Testers will sometimes have questions for me. I'll do some testing on it. And again, might go back to the subject matter experts. And it's just this big loop until everybody has concluded that what we have there is what we want to have there and that it's something that can now be built upon um, to do other things. And um, that is the life of the product owner. I think that's all I have. So I thought we would, um, this is the point where we're gonna transition to the Q&A portion. And I'm, I know that you guys probably have thousands of questions, uh, but while you're composing your thoughts, um, I'm going to start the conversation, the Q&A session, by asking um, our vendor representatives here sort of a question about what's in it for them. I think it's fairly apparent how libraries are going to benefit from this project, um, you know, through more innovation and diversity of options in the LSP world. But if the vendors aren't building something that they're now going to sell to us, like if they're not building this piece of software that we're going to pay for, what is it? What's in it for the vendors? Hello, I am Lynn Bailey with Index Data. And um, one of the things that you've heard Kevin and uh, Tanya mention is some of the services that, uh, that can be provided. And so while we are one of the original stakeholders in this project and we've done a lot of the architecture and design and we are currently doing a lot of core development and app development, we are also building a services organization uh, around Folio that will provide hosting, implementation, and consulting services uh, for, for libraries. Um, and it would stand to reason, we hope, that uh, with our background that we've had uh, building this and with the expertise that we have in-house, that we are a, a good match for libraries that are looking for assistance uh, in those areas. Um, we, we are a small boutique firm, so our target uh, audience will be different than, say, EBSCO, because we'll be doing a lot of the same things, but, um, uh, and we were really pleased to announce that we're partnering with the Flow Libraries to help Wentworth Institute of Technology and Simmons University go live in 2020. Yeah, so, um, hi, my name is Andrew Nagam with EBSCO, and uh, very similar to Lynn at, at Index Data, um, EBSCO's thinking about how can we help our customers leverage this great new technology. The Folio community is leading some really exciting innovations in workflows, in processes that libraries use on a daily basis to optimize um, and, and be more effective and efficient. And we want to make sure that our customers have the ability to do this. We hear from so many libraries, sounds great, but we can't do open source. We don't have the team for it. We don't have the staff. Um, and so we, we're, we're really excited. Index Data and other partners are here to be able to provide services and support libraries so that everyone can use this uh, exciting new technology um, at, at any size library, making it no different than adopting uh, a solution from a commercial uh, product or, or vendor and what you would expect to get out of that, that, that uh, support, the hosting, the training, the documentation, um, I've been talking about open source for much of my career and I remember in the early days one librarian told me I need somebody to sue in case something goes wrong. So we're here in case you need somebody to sue ultimately. Um, but an another great example is Index Data and, and EBSCO. We have a lot of really great technology. Um, we have a lot of really great uh, things that we've been providing to our customers for a long time. Uh, EBSCO has our discovery product, our knowledge base, our link resolver. And we want to make sure that all of those products can be integrated in with Folio. So um, the great thing about Folio being an open community developed solution is that means anybody can build on this platform. Like Jesse said with the iPhone example, um, having a platform where you have thousands and thousands of companies all around the world building additional functionality for that platform. 
and making that really useful. I like to joke that there's probably about 400 different flashlight apps on the marketplace for the iPhone. Why do we need 400 apps for turning on and off the light on the back of your phone? Um, it would be great to see you know, such great choice and selection coming to the Folio marketplace. And so EBSCO wants to make sure, and I'm sure Index Data and, and uh, other vendors as well, want to make sure that our products and services can be easily accessed and fully integrated in with Folio. So as the libraries start to come on board with this product, they also can leverage all the great things that we've been doing, and we can continue to partner with you and help you be even more successful. So there's a lot to gain from a vendor's perspective, and we're here helping this community become more vibrant and grow. Um, and it's something that we're extremely excited about. So do we have any, uh, any questions? If anybody would be, if, um, has anything to ask at all, there's a mic right up here. Come on up. If not, we've got some other seed questions. <laughs> We're going to make you ask a question. Yeah. I even have a brief thing to add to the whole what, what's in it for the vendors question, which is what's in it for vendors that aren't currently involved. Um, I think um, uh, at least from on, in the most basic sense, I think, other library vendors we work with uh, at Cornell University, um, we would really love to be able to do our ordering process for all the different vendors we work with. Uh, Casalini, Amalivra, Harasowitz, uh, directly from Folio, for example. Um, and so whatever tools you might already have for sort of uh, system integration and things like that, uh, there may be some amount of work to get those integrated, but, um, and I think there'll be libraries willing to help do that, uh, possibly even other third parties willing to help to get some of that integration together so that um, the selectors at Cornell and the acquisition staff can really see sort of the world of what is available and, and, uh, and we can streamline the process of getting that through our folio instance. Um, and that's just one sort of booksellers, but cereals vendors. Um, and I, I, I like to think there will be vendors out there that we don't know about yet that will enter sort of the library marketplace to some extent because Folio gives them a window into that. Right. Anybody can build an app or a plugin or an integration point. Uh, it can be a vendor, it can be a library with a technical staff, uh, it can be a hacker at home um, that, that wants to just get creative. Because the software is uh, under the Apache 2 license, it's freely available to anybody. There will be no software charge to a library of any size to use it. And because it's modular, uh, it allows folks to take either a piece of the platform, like the core platform, um, or the whole set of ILS apps uh, and implement that. Um, in fact, uh, we have been spearheading a project uh, called Project Reshare which is um, a resource sharing initiative. And in that, we've taken the core platform of Folio plus the inventory app, and we're building a whole service around that. And that means that you don't have to be a Folio library in order to use this service, um, but you can be a Folio library, and any of the apps that are built on top of it will work. So that's just an example of uh, how other vendors or individuals or libraries can actually build on the platform uh, with, with ease. We have questions. Sure. Yes. So I, I'm going to ask the stupid question. Um, so I've been watching Folio for a while, and I just I I can't get around. Like, is anybody like actually using it right now? And and then so we have um, we're an OCLC library. So I mean, would that mean we would have a discovery layer through Folio? And I mean, see, that's where I get lost. I mean, I get the idea of a platform, but I'm, I'm just not sure about the, uh, the everyday. I want to see what it looks like and what it does. Right. So I'll let somebody else answer the question about is anybody using it right now, because I know we have some uh, libraries either imminently going live or already live. I I'll let somebody else answer that because um, I've lost a little bit track of what's going on there. But um, in terms of something like a discovery layer, Folio is designed to be discovery layer agnostic. So it is purely back end, it is purely a staff system that you can layer whatever discovery system you want on top of that. So if you are a library that's currently using something like EDS or WorldCat and you would want to continue that as your discovery layer, then you would simply integrate that with Folio. Um, the Folio project itself is not 
coding a discovery layer, but there is um, a, another, there is a discovery layer under the, is the OLF, OLE, uh, anyway, the Viewfind is now Viewfind. part of, <laughs> I don't remember if it's OLF or OLE, but oh. Viewfind is also under the auspices of the same um, sort of like owner uh, as Folio, so it is, an, it is an open source discovery layer that you could implement alongside it. But, you know, there's been a lot of talk in the, in the ILS world for a long time about um, the opportunity to have uh, your, you know, the, the software that your staff uses not dictated by the software you want your public to use and vice versa. And I think this is actually a genuine opportunity to have that because it's never really quite been true. It's never really lived up to that process, to that prospect, but I think we're getting there and I think that's what Folio is going to be is discovery layer agnostic, so. Uh, again, from EBSCO's perspective, our goal is to make sure that our products are fully integrated. So we've done the work to integrate EDS, our discovery tool, in with Folio. I think the community will all agree that we're really designing and building solutions for the back end, not patron facing. Um, because there's so many great patron facing tools out there today. Uh, Johns Hopkins University is a library who is working on using Folio just to power some of their web pages. Um, they've, they're, they're building a database A to Z portal using Folio as a way to manage their databases and then presenting that to patrons through custom apps that they've been building. Um, so the core development that, that Lynn mentioned is really about how do we get libraries to replace their ILS system and get that out of the way. But what the rest of the community is really excited about is how do we build some of these cool innovative tools like patron facing things, like analytics, like other action items uh, that you all have been thinking about over the years. Now, EBSCO is currently working with uh, the three beta libraries um, who are working on bringing up Folio, and probably will be some of the very first libraries to bring up Folio um, using EBSCO's hosted instance. Uh, we have Chalmers University of Technology in Sweden, we have University of Alabama in Alabama, and we have um, the five colleges in central Massachusetts. Now, that was next to the monsters, or was it? <laughs> yeah, okay, um, somewhere in the monsters or the middle the of nowhere. I think that's in the dragon section. Dragon section of Massachusetts. Um, and so, so we have consortia, we have um, small technical universities, we have large, big ARLs um, that we are actively working with to bring them up. So I think the very first library going live is going to be Chalmers University of Technology in Sweden, and that's sometime between today and this summer is from what I understand what their timing is. And they should be, in theory, the first library to actually use it to fully replace their ILS. So when we say go live with it, that means they're no longer relying on an ILS system. They're using the Folio platform to power circulation, cataloging, acquisitions, but then other things as well, discovery integration and all the other tools that, that their library is using. Um, so it's going to be, you're going to start to see more and more libraries uh, going live with it. I know uh, some, of the, some of the panels here, some of the members of the panel here are, are going to be early adopters as well of the solution. So a lot is happening, but the factor is, is that we're trying to aim for choice. So uh, yeah, Viewfind is now a viable option. They've included the integration with Folio in their latest release. Um, so you can now use Viewfind with Folio together. You have a patron-facing interface. You can use EDS. Um, I think Cornell uses Blacklight, so at some point Blacklight will be interfacing in with, with Folio. And now you'll have a whole, you won't have 400 apps, but you'll have a couple of different patron-facing apps that you can choose from that are going to best fit your library's need. And that's really why we're all here, what it's all about is uh, having a choice of what you guys want rather than being dictated to a, a very specific black box. Just, uh, yes. <laughs> Another, Another colleague of ours. This is uh, Kristen Martin. Um, and so a uh, colleague of Jesse, Peter McCracken, and I will be doing a demo of Folio as part of our presentation tomorrow at 4. Uh, it's going to focus on the electronic resources management portion. But we will point out where you can look at the demo system and see some general functionality if that's kind of, you're like, what is this? Because this, I realize this session didn't have that. I, I think if you go uh, up here is wiki.folio.org, there's a lot of information that's all up there about the state of the um, project, including, I think there's some links to. Yeah, Index test. Data is hosting a live demo. Yeah, so, so if you really want to go take a look at it, go to wiki.folio.org. 
and um, there's all kinds of information about that, about the various stakeholders who are involved. Um, you can download Folio if you want to install it on your laptop. Um, so, um, which is not necessarily just clicking on a button. No, yeah, <laughs> it's a little more. Com yeah, yeah, it's, it's not running a Microsoft installer at this point. But, um, <laughs> but um, just to uh, kind of piggyback a, a little bit on on what Folio does and what it's used for, we are. So um, to reiterate, in 2020, we intend to go live with two members of the um, Fenway Library organization. It would be um, my university, Wentworth Institute of Technology, and Simmons University. And that would be going live with the full core, sort of core um, integrated library system. And that, that's really exciting, but, I, but for me, the more exciting stuff is the fact of Folio as a platform and that we can access all of the data underneath that platform. We can put arbitrary data in it, that is any data that we may not even realize that we need to use for a library or some other integrated service down the road. So it's got all this potential for that. We have access to all, it's, it's entirely built on APIs, and I don't want to get too deep in the technical weeds, but basically that means any of the services that run the system you have access to. So, so there's no restriction there, it's entirely open, and this means on a practical level that you can come up with just, a, just an entire or a whole raft of new services. Like some examples that we're thinking that we would love to do are things like really, you know, how many of you do course reserves? Um, uh, you know, what, what if your students can just log into a library account, see their schedule, so you have integration with the scheduling system that ever, whatever your university has, registrar system, see their current schedule, click on a, click on a link, see their syllabus pulled from, say, a, um, a learning management system, you know, Blackboard Canvas. There's also your library reserve books, pull in your library reserve books, and now you, now you have for the students sort of a, a, this, this, this wider view of the resources for any given class that they may need. Things like that are really possible with a system like this where you're talking about real, um, uh, real integration. And that, to me, is the more exciting thing here. So it's going to be great to do this cool um, uh, new flexible um, library, core library platform, but, but really it's the new stuff. Think about, think about the stuff that you can do with um, or that, that, that we libraries now have to do to sort of continuously prove our worth and relevance to, to the, the university that, that um, you know, how can we integrate with student success data, student success systems are the ways that we can, that we can feed data back and forth between systems to show use of the library, you know, if it affects grades, and, and in a way that's sort of real time, or, or systems that flag, you know, students who might, who might really need assistance, be in trouble, students who are not doing so well over here in, in, in class A, and, and um, uh, maybe they, there are some red flags that we might be able to flag in terms of library use or lack thereof, for example. So uh, I'm just kind of vamping here on what the possibilities are, but again, I think my point is, is that, that even more so than just the core stuff, this, this, these other things are possible and are really cool and interesting. Hi, just had a quick question. Um, Kristen Walker from UT Austin, and I was wondering, is the migration from another platform to Folio something that we would be able to do ourselves, or is this something we'd have to enlist index data to perform for us and pay a big fee for that? No, that's, a, that's a fair question. Um, it's something that you can do yourself. Uh, I, I think it all depends upon the technical capabilities of your staff. Um, we haven't actually explored to see yet what it's going to take to do a full migration. We'll be working with Wentworth in particular as we, as we learn that. Um, and I think EBSCO similarly is, is learning with their early adopters what it's, what it's going to take to do a migration. If you want to host it yourself and support it yourself, you certainly can. I, I believe, actually, Desh, you, you might want to say yep. something, but Cornell and Texas A&M, for example, intend to do it themselves. Um, Duke and University of Chicago also, as far as I understand, are, are looking to do a lot of this themselves. But there may be places or um, elements that, that the, any university might want to contract with a, a provider to either provide assistance or guidance or like you might in, in any kind of other implementation. Um, and yeah, so Cornell University, our intent all along so far has been to uh, host the system ourselves, including getting uh, 
uh, migrated over to it. That said, we are also uh, kind of seeing what's happening with uh, some of the vendors involved um, and some of our some of the peer libraries. We're currently a Voyager library, so we're talking with uh, Texas A&M in Alabama that are that are Voyager libraries. What can we share there to either figure out this is, might be a terrible idea to try to do the migration ourselves or the three of us can really work out the nuts and bolts of that and, and get migrated over. It's not just gonna be Voyager either. We have an ERM system. We have other things that are gonna be trying to, we're gonna be trying to get together uh, without it looking like we've crammed data from a bunch of different places and having to sort it all out in the end. So um, I'd like to say sort of the sky's the limit and we're in, in terms of the options of how to do that. Um, I imagine we'll probably end up with a little bit of a hybrid getting some help in some places with the migration and, uh, and then doing chunks of it ourselves as well. I, I want to make, make it clear that I, I hope there's no, um, we, we are not suggesting that this is entirely free and you're not, you're going to be able to roll this over easily without any kind of costs. That's probably unrealistic. Um, but there are going to be a lot of vendors out there like us that are going to be providing services uh, besides EBSCO and, and Index Data. Bywater Solutions has, has said they are, will be providing services. Cersei Dynex has talked about providing services. And we expect a lot more uh, vendors and, and small companies to pop up to provide those kinds of services, much like Koha and the other uh, open source ILSs that exist. There are, there are numerous vendors out there that, that do provide services. So. So, um, Jesse, are, do you know, there's a bunch of people talking on the Slack channels about test, like ingesting data um, and doing a lot of test, like crosswalking um, of their data into uh, Folio. Is Cornell one of the libraries that's currently doing that? And do you have, know any details about that? Um, Cornell has people involved in that, in those discussions. Um, we haven't yet really started, uh, well, I guess we've been talking about what data we want, what data we're okay sort of leaving behind, what data we can just stash somewhere in case an accountant asks for it or something. Um, but uh, we haven't yet started actually doing it in our system. We only recently got a, a essentially a test system up and running and we're eager to get our own data in there and that's gonna be part of the process of figuring out just how hard that is or I assume the first time or two or three will be kind of hard but right. we'll ease up and that'll help inform the process for others. And, and that's another important distinction, I think. Because this is an open source project, you can expect to see the teachings and learnings that we and other vendors uh, will be learning along the way and we'll be putting that, that out into the community so that you can benefit from that. So the first, the first handful, yeah, they'll probably be painful. Sorry, Kevin. <laughs> um, but um, but as, as, as we get more established and as the software becomes uh, more established, um, and as more libraries go live, uh, the benefit of, of all of that expertise will become available. Um, whether, whether you've got a good staff that can take that and, and use it all uh, for your own implementation, that remains to be seen, but at least that information will be shared and out there so that it's not, you're not gonna have to start from, from ground zero and or hire a vendor that is from scratch. You'll, have, you'll, have, uh, you'll be well on your way if you choose to. And there's a lot of unknowns right now because nobody has actually gone live with Folio all or even, say, subsets of it. And so we're excited to see some of those come online. It's a little daunting, but it's also really exciting. And we're getting there. I think we have, so we have time for one more minutes. question. Two minutes. One more question. Do you have a question? Okay. We'll make one up. Did anyone pack appropriately for the weather? <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, nice. Two or three of them. Good job. Gold stars. Thank you all.